Welcome to Psyched for Psychology, a Nystrom & Associates podcast. Our hosts, Michelle Iverson and Brett Cushing, are both licensed marriage and family therapists at Nystrom & Associates. Each week, they talk about all things mental health and therapy, and you get a chance to dive into specific psychology topics that help promote personal development and wellness. And now, here are your hosts, Michelle and Brett. Welcome to another podcast edition of Psyched for Psychology. My name is Brett Cushing. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here at Nystrom & Associates. And I'm Michelle Iverson, also licensed marriage and family therapist at Nystrom & Associates. Uh, our podcast has an email. If you haven't had the opportunity to email us yet, please do. You can get in contact with us at podcast at nystromcounseling.com. We want to hear all of your feedback and comments, and we would love to take any kind of questions or ideas for topics that you would love to hear us talk about in the future. Before we start, we want to talk a little bit today about what it was like to prepare for this podcast. Right. We had to do some extensive research. Yes. You know, we were really delving deep into areas of uh, profound psychological research. And the way we did that, we had the dreadful task of watching episodes of Friends. How many of you watched Friends? We all love Friends, don't we? Yes, that classic 90s, early 2000s TV show. You know, I recently heard, actually, my wife was telling me that there's a resurgence. People are starting to watch it all over again. And the ratings for all the reruns are really going up. It's timeless. It and one of the timeless pieces of that is what we're going to be talking about today. And that was that episode of Ross and Rachel uh, when they were on a break. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other great ones. I, I love all the Thanksgiving ones. Those were, uh, I think, epic for me. Did you have a favorite? Yeah, I'm trying to think of my favorite Friends episode. Um, I think it has to do uh, probably with the one just because I think it can't happen in today's day and age. The one where they get stranded in the car, like they're they're oh, driving, yeah. they get stranded in the car, <laughs> side of the road, nothing around them. And they ran into so many problems where it's like, okay, if you had a cell phone, <laughs> this right. would not be an issue. <laughs> if we were able to call an Uber, this would not be an issue. Right. But they didn't have any of that available to them then. Yeah, it's funny. Times have changed. We can watch oh. that show and we can see how much time has changed <laughs> since that episode or all of those episodes. And what has not changed mm -hmm. is the dynamic of what happened between Ross and Rachel, the mm -hmm. the lack of communication and all the, the dynamics of on again, off again, we're good, we're not mm -hmm. good. The prevailing uh, phrase that kept coming up, which mm -hmm. was we're on a break, right? <laughs> or we were on a break and the confusion about that. Hopefully, uh, for our listeners today, you might actually be able to determine, based on the content we shared today, you might actually be able to determine conclusively, were they on a break or not? So how does that relate, though, Michelle, specifically yeah. to what we're talking about today? Well, what we decided that we wanted to do, we actually did this topic. If anybody, if this sounds familiar to anyone, we did a Facebook Live event on this about a month ago, right, as part of like our kickoff for this podcast. And so we wanted to talk about it again today because we wanted this to be available online, too. So people could really not just, if you couldn't attend for the live, get to hear us talk about this idea of the four horsemen. So we, when we hear four horsemen, we think of the apocalypse, but we know of it as the four horsemen of our relationships and how that can really damage our relationships as well. And so we are going to do this topic again for this podcast so all of our listeners can get the opportunity to really hear about these four horsemen and how they negatively impact relationships and how they impacted Ross and Rachel throughout the show on Friends. And I'm so glad we're doing this because yes. I think we can relate to Ross and Rachel mm -hmm. and how there are things that happen in our relationships, things that are sort of not totally resolved. When I work with couples, a lot of times they sort of say, well, yeah, we got into a fight. And I say, mm -hmm. oh, great. All right. Tell me, how did you resolve that? How did you reconnect again? And they say, um, like, what do you mean? And I say, well, you know, you disconnected. How do you reconnect? And they sort of look at me with a deer in the headlights. Then they say, well, we got over it. And I said, right. well, that's great. How does that happen? How did you get yeah. over it? And then there's still this pregnant pause. And 
they don't really know. And so we conclude that, well, we just sort of travel around the sun again and again, and it sort of goes away, but it never really does. Mm -hmm. And that really typifies what was happening with Ross and Rachel. And I, I think we can all relate to this. And I'm eager for us to be able to share what the four horsemen are mm -hmm. as it relates to the apocalypse of relationships. So it keeps saying four horsemen, and what we are referring to is the research that was done uh, by doctors John and Julie Gottman. If you've ever heard that term Gottman before, you will find that there's a lot of couple therapists who have used the research that they've done entirely on couples and how couples communicate and um, be able to resolve conflict. And so this comes from their research to better understand all of these issues that couples face. So then therapists like us, we can better help the couples that come into our office. And so part of like how they determined these horsemen, they were really looking for some of the biggest indicators of what could predict divorce in couples. And what are those communication patterns that could better help us to predict and understand when that might occur? And of course, therapists, we love metaphors. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of cre they created this four horsemen metaphor to understand those most common, most destructive communication patterns. Um, however, there's also an antidote for each and every single one of them. We're going to tell you about those today, too. So there is hope for all of us. And it, it starts off gloom and doom a little bit with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And that sounds a little bit daunting. Mm -hmm. And it is highly practical because as we share this, I'm confident everybody will be able to identify where are we and by the end, know what we can do specifically to help. Mm -hmm. What I found really striking in the Gottman research was that they were able to predict at the sort of with 90 percent accuracy mm -hmm that if, if a couple was going to end in divorce based on some of their research. So we'll kind of yeah. highlight that as we go. Can you highlight for us what those four horsemen are? Absolutely. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail on each of these a little bit later on. But when we think about the four horsemen and what each antidote is, you're going to hear these from us later in the podcast. The first horseman would be criticism. And the antidote for that is a gentle startup. The second, defensiveness. And the antidote, taking responsibility. The third, stonewalling. And the antidote, self-soothing. And finally, the fourth one, contempt. This is the one we have the most concerns about. We'll talk about why. But the antidote for that one, building a culture of appreciation. So I want to provide a little example of how the four horsemen really can play out in a very simple, very trivial kind of uh, example. So for instance, my wife and I, we in our home, we have a junk drawer and we have different opinions of how the junk drawer is to be organized. And she had uh, gone into the junk drawer looking for something and the junk drawer was kind of a mess. And she said, why, why doesn't anybody ever put anything back where it's supposed to? And that sounded to me like that first aspect of criticism. I felt like I was being criticized. And so I did what comes natural for me. And I became very defensive. And I said, well, I always put things back. I never, you know, neglect putting things away. And a junk drawer is supposed to be a place you throw things anyway. And so mm -hmm. then there was this sort of interplay of criticism, defensiveness, criticism, defensiveness, kind of back and forth. And then... Uh, we were able to resolve it. But what typically can happen is we go into stonewalling. Mm -hmm. So we get upset. You know, I can't believe she's so critical all the time. Why does he always have to be so defensive? And then what happens is like I would go to my man cave and she would go to her big cave or her she shed or wherever women go. I don't really know. <laughs> and then we're stonewalling. We're really avoiding each mm -hmm. other and we're not talking about it. And we're holding on to frustration. And that can build up into that last aspect you talked about, Michelle, of contempt. And that is this bitterness, this sense of agitation with the other. And that's mm -hmm. the one that Gottman was able to research and find with couples when the level of contempt reached a certain height, they could predict with 90% accuracy that it was no longer a matter of if, but when the relationship was going to be over. So that's just a simple illustration uh, on a very trivial level, mm -hmm. but very real life for us, how 
these four horsemen can come into play. Right. And I think one of my favorite things about you sharing that example too, Brett, is it shows how normal this is, right? You can be in a fantastic, wonderful relationship with your partner and still experience these. We're so we're therapists. okay. Laura and I, we're right. okay. Right. right? Oh, okay, <laughs> and good. We're, and we're therapists, you and I, and we know about this and we can still experience this in yeah. relationships. Yeah. I appreciate you really highlighting that because this is normal. Mm -hmm. It's okay if we do this. In fact, it's an opportunity for growth if we mm -hmm. think about it. And the opportunity for growth are these antidotes we're going to be talking about. Yeah, that's what we and you're going to hear from us um, about how our ideas behind this. It's not to it's not to shame. It's not to say like your relationship is bad. That is not the point here. The entire point is being these communication patterns happen and we just need to be able to recognize them and then get some help with applying those antidotes and doing that right away. So let's talk about these horsemen in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to start with that very first one, criticism. So when we hear the word criticism, sometimes we get a little confused because sometimes it's like, well, I've, I've, I've got a legitimate complaint about something that my partner is doing right now. And I don't want to feel like I can't say anything about it. And it's, that's not the point. And that's not really what the criticism issue is. The difference between a complaint which can be very healthy in relationships and criticisms, which we don't want. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to have you listen and tell me if you can tell the difference between these two that I'm going to say. This first one is going to be the complaint. I was really worried when you came home late last night and you didn't text or call. You know, I really, I know we discussed letting each other know when we would be home. Now listen to the criticism. You are so selfish and you never think about me and how it would make me feel. You never think of others and you are unbelievable. So can you tell the difference? I can feel the difference. <laughs> yes. I mean, of course, one of the first things you might pick up on, maybe the difference in tone, of course. But did you notice which one had I words and which one had you words? The I words were associated with the complaint, the one we want. The you words were the ones associated with the criticism. So what's the antidote? We want to use a gentle startup. We want to use those I words, those I statements with our partner, even more so preferably if there's a feeling paired with it. You notice with that initial complaint, I started with, I was worried. That is going to help to reduce any possible defensiveness, which we'll talk about next. But it also allows for the ability for me to make a comment on what's going on with my partner's behavior without it feeling like a comment on their personality or who they are. Mm. So like we said earlier, we watched Friends. We watched a good amount of Friends mm -hmm, <laughs> in yeah. preparing for this. Because Ross, Ranch, Rachel, man, oh, man, uh, those two, <laughs> where do we start? Uh, if you've seen the show, which I'm sure many of our listeners probably have. Uh, this was not a one-time conflict for them. There was a lot of communication issues. I mean, we are talked, talking more about the early earlier seasons when mm -hmm. they were having the infamous we were on a break fight. Uh, but this kind of continued these patterns throughout the entire length of the show. And you know what's interesting? Everybody could see it. Yes. Uh, all the other cast members, you know, in their characters they were playing, mm -hmm. they they knew that this wasn't resolved. Mm -hmm. And as as you watch it, you knew it wasn't resolved. You just knew it was going to come up again. Right. But it was funny how Ross and Rachel never really wanted to admit that this is not resolved. Right. Yeah. Right. They probably would be that couple coming into your office, and you if they were. In a period where things are okay, you might be asking, why? How did you resolve things? And they would probably be that couple that would just be like, we just let it go and we moved on. Right, we're over it. Right. right. But they really never weren't. Yes, <laughs> or good never point. <laughs> so let's use an example from Friends. Right before that infamous breakup happened, that first time. So Rachel had said the words, I think we need a break. There were a number of criticisms happening from Rachel to Ross after he started a fire at her work. So we're not going to get into details on that. If you want to watch the episode, please do. Um, but essentially, to just 
briefly sum that up. He started a fire at her work. It wasn't good. Uh, so she, of course, would have some, I think, legitimate complaints, but she turned them into criticisms because this is what she said to him. You had no right coming down to my office, Ross. You do not bring a picnic basket to somebody's work. You want me to quit my job so that you can feel like you have a girlfriend. You're making this too hard. Maybe we should just take a break, a break from us. So could that last one, could that have been prevented? I mean, who knows? But a gentle startup might have helped. Using I feel statements like I felt scared or I feel like my work isn't valued might have reduced Ross's defensiveness, might have stopped that argument from continuing to escalate, but still would have allowed Rachel to share her legitimate complaint. Don't start fires in my office. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. It was very legitimate <laughs> for sure. And uh, hard, hard for Ross to hear that. Mm-hmm. So that takes us into, into the next one. What Ross did. Yes. What Ross, well, we, most of us know what Ross did uh, because they were going to go on a break. Mm-hmm. And that's where the rub is. What does a break mean? They both had different understandings of what that <laughs> meant. And what it meant for Ross is, well, it's kind of okay to go sleep with somebody that night. And mm-hmm. so Rachel finds out about it. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, hurt, betrayal, anger because her sense of what being on a break was versus Mm -hmm. he thought they were over and she had rejected him. And so we see this next aspect of defensiveness occur in another scene with them. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me how natural this is, the sense of defensiveness. You know, my wife is very good at helping me see things. I don't always like what she shows me. Sure. You know, I re- do remember one time she said, you know, you are really defensive. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and then, as soon as the words came out, I'm like, no, I really, no, I'm not. And I wanted to sort of further, you know, say, Take prove, the heels I'm, not, I'm not. And uh, it was just really proving the fact that I, I was and I didn't like that. But it comes so natural. It just, Mm -hmm. it came out once and I knew I was being defensive. And then I wanted to be defensive as to why I'm being defensive. Mm -hmm. And I, I've noticed we get all sorts of seminars we can go to to learn how to be better therapists. People do at their workplaces. And I've never seen a seminar on how to become more defensive, right? Mm -hmm. Because it comes so naturally. I could put on a a whole seminar all day on how to be (laughs) defensive. It's just so natural. And it's so visceral, you know, yes. it happens so quickly. Mm-hmm. So we see that with Ross and Rachel, uh, if we don't see it already in our own relationships. But Ross and Rachel, they decided they're going to get back together again mm-hmm. after she had written him uh, an 18, well, really 36 page uh, letter and all about kind of how he was the main person, if not the sole person culpable for what happened in the relationship. Mm -hmm. He really didn't read it and said he did. So then they sort of make up and they have this intimate moment. They're lying in bed and she's reflecting back how great it is that he finally took responsibility for everything. And he just needed a little more time to realize that he really messed up Mm -hmm. and shares that sign. There's that line she always says and my wife laughs at where Rachel says, I remember my mom always saying, once a cheater, always a cheater. And you can see mm-hmm. Ross getting so angry and so frustrated. And then comes out the infamous line and you hear it throughout mm-hmm. pretty much the whole apartment complex. And he says, we were on a break. And he is so angry. Mm-hmm. And then everything blows up again. Yeah. So he's getting very defensive about what he's hearing from her. And what he's doing is he's personalizing it. He yes. is really making it all about him. And in reality, that's about her. What she says is about her and what's going on inside of her. Mm-hmm. And he's getting defensive himself. Now, the antidote for defensiveness, it's not easy. It doesn't come naturally for us. So it takes some intentionality, but it's to take responsibility. Mm-hmm. To take responsibility for things, then Ross didn't want to take responsibility for anything. Mm -hmm. Just like I didn't want to take responsibility for the fact that I am defensive sometimes. And it's hard for us to do. Now, what would that have looked like? Part of taking responsibility is uh, knowing what not to take responsibility for. He did not have to take responsibility 
for her experience, her perceptions, her words, her emotions, because why? Those are hers. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways we avoid taking responsibility that's really not ours is to just reflect back to the person what we hear them saying. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying, Ross could have said, is that you are thinking I needed to take full responsibility for everything. And that's really important to you. And you felt I just needed more time to realize this. Mm -hmm. Now, that's hard to reflect that back because it feels like I'm agreeing with the other person. Yeah. Yeah. And that's super hard to do. But it if Ross did that, mm-hmm. he would not necessarily have been agreeing. He just would have been acknowledging that this right. is what's going mm-hmm. on for you. Now, it's interesting because when people do have a sense that somebody understands me, that's a form of validation that brings down their level of emotion mm-hmm. and it allows people to disagree and mm-hmm. be okay. And then he could have also taken responsibility for what was his. He could have said you know what? I did go out. That was irresponsible for me. What I did, I can Mm -hmm. see where that would have been really hurtful for you. I really wish I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. And he could have gone on and on and taken responsibility for what was really his. So in short, it's really reflecting back to the person so that we're not taking responsibility for things that aren't ours and then taking full responsibility. Like I could have said to my wife, Okay, so you're really upset that things are not put away and that's Mm -hmm. super frustrating for you. Okay. And you know what? I I realize I can be defensive about Mm -hmm. this and I want to apologize. I can work harder at that. And maybe we can talk about how the junk drawer needs to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, It sounds like a lot of work, but it's a lot less work than the chaos and the conflict and the frustration that happens as a result of not doing these things. So Mm -hmm. that is defensiveness and how it could have played out, uh, not only for me, but also for Ross and for Rachel. So let's go into that third horseman. We're talking about stonewalling next. So this one, Gottman kind of found that this one happens a lot in response to the last horseman that we're going to talk about, contempt. And this is what happens when we become emotionally flooded in an argument with our partner. We shut down. We cannot engage meaningfully in any way with them. And I think many of us, when we say emotionally flooded, I think many of us get a picture and get a feel for that because I think many of us have experienced it. Mm -hmm. When I think about times that I've become emotionally flooded, I can think about the the, that feeling of being so shut down, but also sometimes that pressure of feeling like we need to work through this. We still need to somehow tackle this and address it, but I am not in the headspace to be mm. able to do so. And so people will sometimes continue to stay stuck in that flooded state rather than engaging in the antidote, which would be self-soothing. So self-soothing a big piece of self-soothing needs to be doing what I should have been doing those moments when I couldn't further engage and I was flooded, which was to take a time out. You know, Gottman would actually call this taking a break, but we probably wouldn't use a phrase like that with Ross and Rachel, given their <laughs> predicament. Uh, so we're going to call it timeouts. I actually prefer that phrase of taking a timeout uh, because I like to say timeouts are not just for kids. We can use them as adults. We can use them with our partners. It's just telling our partner, we can't do the conversation right now, but I'm going to let you know when I can come back to it. And when I do that, I take that time out for myself. I take that time I need to get out of the situation for a moment, not forever, but to take that time to go do my self-care, go do my self-soothing whether it's self-validating, affirmations, whatever it is that I need in that moment to eventually be able to come back to my partner and actually finish the discussion, but make it productive and make it helpful. So there there was examples of stonewalling (laughs) with Ross and Rachel. After finding out initially that Ross had his affair, they were in Rachel and Monica's apartment just arguing all night until 3 a.m., And Rachel engaged, if you watch that episode, it's in season three, she engaged in multiple examples of stonewalling all throughout the scene, sitting on the couch. You might imagine her 
think this is before the infamous Rachel haircut. So uh-huh. imagine her pre-Rachel haircut <laughs> sitting on the couch, <laughs> arms folded, Ross, you know, just begging her for her forgiveness. And she is just not even going to give him an inch and shut down on that couch. You can clearly see in the scene, she is emotionally flooded. And without a timeout, because they stay, they feel like they should stay and just battle this out and hash this out without her getting a break while stonewalling. She just gets overwhelmed yeah. by his attempts to continue to talk. And then they just officially, they just end things. Mm-hmm. So if she could have taken time out, maybe self-soothed again, who knows? Maybe things would have turned out differently. And things continued for Ross and mm-hmm. Rachel, didn't it? Which really takes us to that last horseman of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and that is contempt. Contempt, as I said earlier, is the most concerning one because Gottman, in his research, found that once the level of contempt that they were able to measure, once it reached a certain level, it was really an issue of uh, time, Mm -hmm. that it's not a, a matter of if, but when they are actually going to file for divorce. And so, Contempt is is uh, very toxic in a relationship. It's that sense of bitterness. Mm-hmm. It's that when the, the relationship has now become extremely toxic and we are focusing so exclusively upon the, the negative and the hurts about the other person. And so we can see why the antidote just is so intuitive. We need to build a culture of appreciation. And so we need to have an opportunity to intentionally remember what we appreciate about the other person and try to have an accepting environment. Now, I've kind of realized this in my own life that uh, when my wife first met me, I was this can-do, positive, high-energy kind of guy, and she was really drawn to that. Mm -hmm. And now, then after a while, she realized, um, wow, this dude's got a ADHD and uh, he's forgetting everything. <laughs> and uh, when we would meet, it was long distance relationship. She would meet me and I'd be like, Hey, let's hug, you know, and this mm-hmm. is great. Let's connect. And sh- she'd be like, okay, we got to, you know, for the wedding plans, we have to do this and that and the other thing. And, I, and she would wonder, does this guy, like, does he have a clue? <laughs> and does he ever follow up on anything? And, and so then what uh, thankfully didn't happen with us, but I think what happens in relationships is, we're drawn to somebody for their positive. And then after a while, we start to see their negative. And we think, not a problem, right? Because mm-hmm. I can change him or I can change her. And that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And then we get irritated. We get frustrated because we see these glaring weaknesses. And then that's what we sort of default to. And then you throw in there sometimes when we're hurting each other, which is inevitable in relationships. And you can see how you know that stonewalling builds up, the, mm-hmm. all of these, the, the criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling. And if it's really not addressed, like it wasn't addressed with Ross mm-hmm. and Rachel, it becomes very problematic. That mm-hmm. contempt really builds. And so we see that because this this line, this we were on a break mm-hmm. continued throughout Friends, even to the, I think you said the, the last, last episode, yeah. it still came up. So classic because it's it, was, it had been forever mm-hmm. the elephant in the room that nobody was going to talk about Mm -hmm. and it was really never addressed Mm -hmm. and how many of us can relate to that Mm -hmm. in our relationship now ironically we're thinking about relationships our romantic relationship our marriage that's even happening in our workplaces Mm -hmm. too and things just aren't addressed and that's sometimes why people leave workplaces Mm -hmm. because that elephant was never addressed and people leave marriages and so as you just highlighted Mm -hmm. there was this contempt with ross and rachel and they left one another so the antidote is creating an atmosphere of acceptance. How do we do that? Well, I think I have just alluding to it. We are intentional. We have to be intentional about the other person's positives. We tend to characterize somebody solely in terms of their weaknesses when we've been hurt by them, especially mm-hmm. if it's been repeated. And then we, we only focus on that and we don't have this appreciation for what we were really drawn to in the relationship with this person in the first place. Mm-hmm. One of the things I do, Michelle, when I meet with couples is I have them check in. So what did you both appreciate about each other over the last week? Mm -hmm. And when they check in, 
they have to think about it for a moment. Mm-hmm. And then they say, oh, yeah, I, I really appreciated when you did this or that and the other things or when you went and you cleaned up all the dishes afterward because mm-hmm. I was so tired. And they both share. And then I ask them, have you shared this with each other prior to coming into session today? And more often than not, they say, no, we really haven't. Mm-hmm. And that to me is so tragic because yeah. it means so much. And we're, we're building that atmosphere of acceptance mm-hmm. when we choose to focus on the positive and be intentional about it. So like maybe even our listeners, I would encourage people that are listening now to think, what have you appreciated about your partner over this last mm-hmm. week? And try to really be intentional thinking about it, but even more so then go out of your way to make it explicit to your partner. Mm-hmm. And these are simple little things we can do to build an atmosphere of acceptance. And you can imagine what Ross and Rachel could have done to deal with this by being more intentional about what they did appreciate. And I was watching an episode recently and they were talking like with each other's friends in the group about what they did miss about the other and what they mm-hmm. did appreciate. But what was tragic again is they weren't they talking to each, each other. <laughs> exactly. So you're kind of like, if you both would talk and it just so adequately reflected mm-hmm. our own relationships as well. I think we get so caught up in thinking, well, my partner knows my partner right. knows, yeah. but so often they don't. We we do want to be intentional in voicing that to them and really letting them know. Yeah, we do take our partners for granted mm-hmm. in, in that way. And I think sometimes when the contempt is building, I kind of dig mm-hmm. in like you were saying, and I want to wait for the other person to make that first move mm-hmm. and validate me because... Clearly, that person's not seeing and appreciating me enough. So why should I go and take that first move? And it's mm-hmm. we get pretty uh, entrenched in our own position that mm-hmm. keeps us from this sort of validation. Right. So if anybody finds that you're experiencing these horsemen, even the contempt, even the one with the greatest predictor for divorce, mm-hmm. that does not mean that we are out of luck. We can get help. These happen in relationships. I mean, that's one of our biggest takeaways. Happen so much. I mean, we could find it in a very classic sitcom show. Mm-hmm. Multiple examples throughout. Because I'm sure the writers for the show, they all experience them too in their relationships. There is hope. There's hope for that. There yeah. is hope. And I, I like how you described it, Michelle, is these these are wounds we have. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching, remember the Hunger Games? Did you watch the yes. Hunger Games at all? There was, yes. uh, I forgot her name, but you know. Katniss. The, the, Katniss, thank yes. you. And she was wounded. I think it was in the first one. Yeah. And one of those little balloon kind of uh, things that you could get, somebody could buy and send you something you need mm-hmm. on, on the Hunger Games uh while they're doing it. And she had this like salve that somebody had sent her and it came in on this balloon and it came right to her and she was in so much pain. She Mm -hmm. acted it out really well. And she took the salve and she just put it on the wound and she played it so well because I could almost feel it Mm -hmm. myself watching her. And it was just this instant relief Relief. and on this wound. And I think Mm -hmm. the antidotes really kind of can have that same effect. They can come yes. to the other in the relationship as this instant salve that mm-hmm. really is soothing and healing on these wounds. And that is where we have a lot of hope. This doesn't have to take forever. Yeah. It just takes some intentionality. And know that with those wounds, each of those horsemen causing its own wound, don't ignore them, right? If Katniss had ignored her wounds, she wouldn't have made it. We, w- we wouldn't have all the movies, right? <laughs> Like yeah. the movie would what be a done. drag that would have what been. a drag yeah. um no like we we cannot ignore those wounds um that could cause lasting damage to the relationship to our partner mm-hmm. and so we got to use those antidotes use them right away and get help if we need help and that's one of the really wonderful things that is really nice about working here, you know, for us is that we work with some really, really great people who can help. Right. There is help. We need to normalize it. And mm-hmm. we hope you can normalize the pain, even normalize the wounds. Doesn't mean that it, they, they aren't painful. It mm-hmm. just means that this is normal and we can get through it together. So we hope that you are coming away with some hope and some practical things you can apply. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Please make sure to like, share, subscribe. Let us uh, know that you're listening. You can 
uh, following us on Psych for Psychology with our podcast. We will have new episodes being released every Tuesday morning. And you can find us on any major podcast stream platform. And you can follow us there for our new episodes. So again, please email us as well if you have any comments, suggestions, ideas for future topics that you'd be psyched to hear us talk about at podcast at nystromcounseling.com. Again, you can also learn more about Nystrom Associates and us and all of our available mental health services by going to nystromcounseling.com. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you as always for listening and please be sure to leave us a review. While this podcast can't be a replacement for therapy, we hope you enjoyed our discussion today and join us again next time. Nice German Associates is always available to those who are struggling. If you find yourself in need of support and help, please check us out at nicestermcounseling.com. Nice